Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, Thursday, September 24th, and uh, welcome to the biochemical engineering class at the University of Toledo. And uh, th this week, uh, we're kind of slowing down a little bit in terms of the lectures. Uh, as you notice, the one on Tuesday, I just put up some uh, YouTube videos you can watch that'll review some concepts you've seen before on the Krebs cycle and glycolysis and things like that. And, uh, you know, just uh, look at those videos and understand that as those different uh, cycles and, uh, and steps work their way out within a cell that uh, those chemicals that are in those processes serve as the backbone then for other chemicals like antibiotics and drugs of various kind that the cell can make for us and, uh, you know, we can isolate those and, uh, and make some money on things that the cells uh, do for us. And uh, this leads us into uh, the next uh, chapters of uh, material we'll be covering, which is how to make uh, chemicals using, uh, using cells. And in today's lecture, what I want to talk about is, um, you know, probably the oldest example of making a, a, a product from cells, which is the fermentation of uh, sugars into eth ethanol. And if we derive those sugars uh, from grapes, uh, we're all familiar that, uh, with the idea then that that's how we make wine. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, wine and the production of wine and, and even how uh, you can make some very good wine at home, which might be a fun thing for you to do during this uh, COVID crisis. Uh, you can sit and make some uh, wine by the gallons and then drink it by the gallons. and. Uh, be very happy, I guess. So, uh, so that's what we'll talk about today. I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through uh, some PowerPoint slides that I have that explain uh, what wine is and how it's produced and so on. So hope 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 you guys are all doing well and uh, staying well and uh, and so on. And uh, so we'll uh, we'll get started. Okay, so what we want to talk about here is uh, the art of uh, making wine. Uh, we'll go through some of the history and uh, production process steps that are involved in making wine, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, how you can make uh, wine at home using these commercially available kits. So the first thing is, uh, you know, what is wine? And wine, as defined by the uh, principal wine producing countries around the world, and actually defined by law, says that wine is the fermented juice of grapes. So in order to be a wine, it has to come from grapes. If, if wine's made from other fruits or vegetables, then you have to add a, a, a descriptor, such as blackberry wine or apple wine or uh, dandelion wine. And, and the juice uh, is produced from wine grapes. And the, the type of grape that's uh, typically used is called uh, Vetus vinifera. And there's, you know, li li literally uh, 5,000 varieties of this grape uh, have been developed. So there's all kinds of uh, varieties and strains of this basic uh, uh, wine type of uh, grape. And that, uh, that grape makes a very uh, sugary juice that when in the presence of, of yeast uh, ferments into uh, ethanol and carbon dioxide. And interestingly, the juice from grapes contains all the stuff needed for that fermentation. So if you have a real good uh, grape, it, it has everything you need to make uh, the wine. So it's got the sugars, it's got the water, there's various minerals, and it even has the yeast. Uh, the yeast grow on, on the surface of the uh, wine skins, and that's what we mean by a wild strain. So, back you know way way before uh, modern microbiology, and people didn't even really un understand what was going on when they would crush the grapes. The yeast would already be present to start the fermentation. But the problem with the wild strains of uh, yeast is the result can be a little bit unpredictable because there's a lot of different uh, fermentation pathways, and you can end up with uh, products other than uh, ethanol or you might get other products mixed in with the ethanol that would give the wine a, a, a bad taste. So if, if you're really in the winemaking business today, uh, what we try to do is suppress the uh, growth of, of the wine yeast and we use special winemaking yeast. So there's special 
varieties of uh, yeast that are uh, used then to make wine. And the sugars are primarily the monosaccharides glucose and uh, fructose. Glucose and fructose are both six carbon sugars and when they combine together they form the disaccharide we all know as uh, sucrose which is also just uh, uh, table sugar. So you, you, you can uh, ferment uh, sucrose and with yeast and uh, just break it down. It'll break down uh, you know via the metabolic pathways into yeast that you know to, to get to the glucose and, and the fructose. Um, you know if you make bread and so on or uh, you know that's really kind of a fermentation going on as well and, and, and the yeast say when you make pizza dough at home uh, the yeast are acting on a little sugar that you add as well as the carbohydrates that are in the flour and uh, you know the, the rising of the dough is due to the production of the carbon dioxide. Little history about wine. Uh, the, the Vitas grape itself has been found in fossils uh, 15 million years old. Uh, primitive cultures are known to have made wine uh, you know 10,000 years ago. So imagine that, you know, they were making wine and uh, organized uh, viniculture is what it's called, but you know, like you know, the, the purposeful growing of, of grapes to make wine occurred in Mesopotamia, which we know as modern uh, day Iraq. And Potamia refers to uh, ri rivers, so Meso would be between the rivers. I can't remember the two rivers in Iraq right now off the top of my head, but in that region there was a real early uh, wine growing uh, reason. A hippopotamus, you know, you're wondering, hip, hip, hippo means horse and potamus river, so a hippopotamus that we all like to see at the zoo, that would be like a, a, a river horse. So it's always fun to dissect words and, uh, and see, uh, you know, where they get their, their meaning from. But, you know, that was 5,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago. Uh, there's some evidence that it was even happening in Armenia. Uh, Egyptian frescoes show grape gathering and wine production. And if you think about it, the conversion of something sweet to a dry, that's what we mean when we say a dry wine, it's non-sweet liquid, along with the pleasant effects of drinking the fermented juice, uh, you know, getting a little, uh, uh, you know, drunk or something, and it's red color, it's got a nice color to it. Made folks in ancient times associate wine with magic, the gods, blood, and life, and even sacred rites that uh, last to the present day. Uh, more history, uh, records of Greek civilization 3,500 years ago show that wine was a popular beverage and a sacred drink. Dionysus in uh, Greek legend, Bacchus by the Romans, the son of Zeus, invented wine on Mount Nisa in Libya. Even the Hebrews think of Noah as the first winemaker. If you go back into the Old Testament, Genesis, here's the little chapter and verse. Uh, you can read about uh, Noah and the winemaking. In the New Testament, Gospel of John, Jesus performed his first miracle and launched his career by turning water into wine at the wedding at Cana. Today, there's so many people, now they want to turn the wine back into water. But that's a whole nother story. <laughs> okay, um, Greeks and Romans lined storage vessels with resin, pine resin, which added additional flavors. Um, if you really want to try a, a pretty wild uh, wine, try uh, the Greek wine. It's called Retsina. I remember drinking a bottle of that with a friend of mine one time at dinner and uh, quite an experience. Got a good buzz off of it. Uh, the medieval uh, Catholic Church and their monks developed new grape varieties. So a lot of the grape varieties that are used today to make uh, wines come from these, uh, you know, early Middle Age, mid Middle Ages, uh, the monks. And, uh, you know, the monks were able to keep themselves, uh, uh, you know, alive by, by grain, olive oil, and wine. That was their livelihood other than, uh, you know, transcribing ancient texts and so on. Uh, the actual growing of uh, grapes, uh, the juice of ripe grapes for wine making contains about 21 to 25 weight percent sugar. So in the fall when these uh, grapes have matured they have a lot of uh, 
sugar in them. That's why the bees swarm around uh, grapes. They love the sugar and there's probably a little fermentation going on which gets the bees drunk, which can be bad news uh, for all of us if you get stung. Uh, the acid content is less than one weight percent. Uh, one of the things when you're uh, making wine is you got to balance the uh, acid contents and there's some uh, kits and so on that allow you to do that but the three main uh, acids or organic acids that are involved in uh, wine production are tartaric acid and here's the uh, formulas malic acid is another one and then uh, citric acid. Uh, why are acids important? Because they add sharpness and a fruity taste. Uh, to, and so the acidity of wine juice may need some adjustment to get that uh, degree of uh, sharpness and the fruity taste that people uh, like to see. Uh, what, what really is happening is the acids react with the alcohol and form esters and, and some of those esters give the uh, wine its uh, flavor and, and bouquet, the, the nice smells and so on. Now grapes, uh, it turns out grapes can practically be, uh, be grown anywhere. Uh, there's different varieties that do better in different places. So, I mean, even here in northwest Ohio, various parts of Ohio, uh, you can find uh, wineries and people successfully growing uh, grapes out on uh, the Putin Bay Islands or the, uh, what, do you, what do you call them, South Bass, Middle Bass Islands out there is big wine production out there. Uh, mostly they want a temperate region and they don't want temperatures too low. Uh, the vines do not require a rich soil. They can thrive in sandy, chalky, rocky soil. Uh, all they want is a sunny uh, location. France and Italy, you know, used to be the leading producers, over 40% of the world's output. Uh, now, you know, California is a real big wine growing region. Uh, the state of Washington's big. Uh, about 90% of U.S. wines made in California and like I said a growing proportion uh, coming from uh, the uh, state of Washington. Locally if you want to have some fun and, uh, and taste some good wines, uh, Traverse City area if you've ever been up in northern Michigan, Traverse City's got a lot of wineries up there. I, I remember being up there for a, for a wedding and then we spent a weekend going around uh, looking at different wineries and, and you know hitting their tasting rooms which is always a lot of fun. Another fun area is uh, Niagara on the Lake region in Canada just north of Niagara Falls. Uh, most people talk about going to Niagara Falls but actually maybe I think it's about 30 miles north of Niagara Falls sitting right on uh, the, the southern shore of Lake Ontario is a, is a really cool city called Niagara on the Lake. I went up there and stayed a few days and did a 40 mile uh, bicycle loop through the uh, wine growing regions up there and uh, they they grow wine up in that region like we grow corn here in Ohio. I mean I never saw so much uh, uh, wine growing and had a, had a blast riding our bicycles and stopping at wineries. Probably stopped at a dozen wineries along the way and uh, yeah, we're pretty plastered by the time we got back uh, to the house we rented in uh, Niagara Falls. Uh, over the years, many of my students have gone up to Niagara Falls. They hear me talk about uh, this stuff in this lecture, and then during spring break or fall breaks, you know, I get emails from them that, "Hey, Durf, I'm up here in Niagara Falls and have have having a blast up there." Also, uh, Australia, uh, they make good wines down there. Chile and Argentina have been become uh, good exporters of wine, and if you like a nice uh, dry red wine. Uh, check out Malbec. Uh, Mal Malbec is a real nice uh, wine. So it's right up there with the Cabernet Sauvignon. So uh, definitely try a Malbec. Uh, types of wine. Uh, wines can differ in their flavor, their aroma, and their alcohol level. Characteristics of wine depend on the variety of grape used and the chemical composition of the vineyard soil. That's all going to affect uh, what the starting ingredients are in the juice that comes from those grapes. Also depends on the methods used for making the wine and the major types of wine I've got listed here kind of uh, tells the no nomenclature uh, non-sparkling or still wines, table or beverage wines that contain less than 14 percent alcohol. 
So, you know, your typical dry red Cabernet Sauvignon would be a non-sparkling still or table wine. Now, your sparkling wines are things like Champagne. They also have less than 14% alcohol. You're probably wondering, what's the magic limit of 14%? Well, what happens is, is when wine or, or when the yeast are fermenting, the sugar, which starts out, you know, in that 21 to 25 weight percent range. If you get the sugar too high, what's going to happen is, is from the stoichiometry, you're going to start making too much uh, alcohol. And at around 13, 14 uh, percent ethanol, ethanol really becomes toxic to the yeast, and they basically shut down the fermentation. So if you put too much sugar in there, what's going to happen is you're still going to end up with 13, 14 percent uh, ethanol but you're going to have, then have a whole bunch of sugar left over in your uh, wine and there's no way you're going to be able to make a dry wine out of that unless you can remove the excess sugar which would be a real uh, hassle. But the sparkling wines such as Champagne uh, you know they have the uh, carbon dioxide in it which uh, you know makes it fizz like a Coca-Cola or something. Personally, I'm not a big fan of, uh, of champagnes. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll drink them for a ceremonial thing, but it's not my uh, first choice. Uh, fortified wines or aperitifs such as port and sherry typically have much higher levels of alcohol. So uh, they may go through a little bit of a distillation to concentrate the alcohol, give it a little more uh, body and uh, you know, a little burn when you uh, drink it. If you've ever had a port or a sherry, it's quite a bit, you know, has, it's quite a bit stronger than a typical uh, table wine. Now, sweet or dessert wine are the sauternes, okay? Uh, sweetness, uh, you know, these kinds of wines, sweet wines are kind of like wines for amateurs. People that really don't drink a lot of wine will want a sweet wine because they think everything they drink needs to be uh, sweet, like a Pepsi or a Coke, but, but people that really appreciate wine are going to go for the, uh, the, the dry wines. But, you know, if you want something after dinner, maybe with a dessert, and you just want to get a sugar load of sweetness, then, you know, you might go for a dessert wine, small glass, just to finish off a, a, a big meal. Now, the aromatic wines, such as vermouth, which is used in martinis, which in my taste palate vermouth is really a foul tasting stuff. I mean if you're going to have a martini I would always tell them to just wave the vermouth bottle over the um, the martini. Just give me my uh, Tanqueray gin straight on the rocks. You know just pour it on the rocks, wave the bottle over it and call it a day. But um, vermouth can be 15 to 20 percent alcohol. And then the spirit wines are, are all distilled, and, and those would typically be things like brandy, which could be, uh, you know, 25-30% alcohol. And wines can come in different colors. You've probably seen them as red, white, or rosé. Rosé is kind of a, a pink. Most red and rosé table wines are dry, meaning they contain only very small amounts of unfermented sugar, less than 0.1% sugar. Now, if you're uh, making uh, sweet wines at home, like, you know, from a kit or something, you got to be real careful when you bottle, even though there's a little residual sugar in there to give the sweetness, you got to make sure you got all the yeast out, because if you cork that bottle and you still have yeast in there, the yeast are going to start acting on that residual sugar, produce CO2 within the cork bottle, and your bottle's going to blow up. The cork's going to fly out at some point in time, and, and if you have those guys laying on their side all that wine's just going to run out and make a big mess. Okay so let's take a look at the making of wine, how wine's made. Uh, here's the basic uh, steps that we'll be talking about. The first thing is you got to go out and collect the grapes, pick them off of the uh, grape vines. Then you uh, press the grapes to get the juice out and then if the skins stay with the juice that's going to make a red wine. If the skins go, if you separate the skins from the juice that'll make a white wine. A, a white wine. Then there's the fermenting of the juice and, and when the juice is fermenting uh, that's called the must. So these are terms you'll want to know like if you go out to Napa Valley or go visit a winery 
Uh, this way you'll 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 know the vernacular and, and, and you won't look like a, a rank amateur when you go there. Uh, the clarifying the wine, you let wine just sit in big tanks or in five gallon jugs if you're doing it at home and the wine clarifies just by settling. You let it just sit there for a month or so and that's called racking. So racking the wine is uh, letting it settle so that the solids and yeast and all this crap that's in there uh, from the pressing and, and so on just settle out to the bottom. Uh, you can also sometimes add settling agents like if you're doing this at home there's clarifiers that you can add that will speed up the clarification so that you can have a drinkable wine in about a month. So basically you, you might rack the wine a couple times, you're taking care of the wine, keeping it uh, you know, stored and, and, and cool and so on, and you just care for it until it's ready to bottle. <clears throat> so grapes are harvested in the fall, like I said they've got a high sugar content, maybe 20, 20 some percent, and the actual yield, if you're thinking about this, if you want to make a gallon of wine, uh, you need about 16 pounds of uh, grape juice. Now the fermentation is caused by the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. There's many varieties of uh, that particular yeast. Um, you know, there's a lot of research has gone into these varieties so that the fermentation happens and gives the desired qualities of the wine. So these are kind of like trade secrets of the big wineries and so on. So they carefully protect and guard the strains that they're uh, using. Also the fermentation is um, anaerobic. So basically you're, you're starting then with the six carbon sugar glucose here and the stoichiometry would be you're going to make uh, for every mole of glucose you're going to get two moles of ethanol, two moles of CO2 and Q is heat. Uh, one of the things that we'll have to realize that when you do this commercially uh, that heat removal from the process can be a problem. As, as a vessel gets larger and larger in terms of its volume, the external surface area decreases so it becomes more difficult to remove the heat of fermentation. And In fact, we'll spend a little time talking about heat transfer and how you design a, a system to remove uh, the amount of heat that's uh, required. So if you look at the theoretical yield, one of the things we'll be getting into as we start talking about making uh, chemicals from cells is there's a thing called the yield coefficient. And the yield coefficient has the symbol Y, so the Y stands for yield. And then the P slash S in this case, the P would be how much product do you get per uh, substrate. So the theoretical yield, just based on the stoichiometry, if, if you took the two moles of ethanol, converted that into grams, and the uh, sugar and converted that into grams, you would find that you're, you're going to get 0.51 grams of ethanol per gram of glucose. That's the maximum theoretical yield that you're going to get uh, from that sugar. Uh, sometimes students go to work for uh, biofuels companies and so on. Uh, you know, I've had a couple that have gone to work in ethanol plants where they make ethanol from the sugars uh, that they get from uh, corn. Okay, It's the same type of a deal. Uh, the only difference is, is that the sugar is coming from corn and not from a grape. So there's your theoretical yield. And usually you're going to get about 90 to 95 percent of this uh, yield because some of the glucose, there's other side reactions going on. And if you're making wine, those side reactions can kind of be important. Uh, even the ethanol is reacting. I was telling you earlier, you know, that's going to, some of it's going to react with the organic acids to form uh, esters and so on which add to the bouquet. Uh, glycerol, there's another side reaction. Uh, you can get some glycerol, which adds some sweetness to it. Uh, not a lot of sweetness, but just you know a, a, a little bit. If you're not careful with what you're doing, if you get a little oxygen in there, you can get some oxidation going on, and you can form some nasty uh, organic acids as well, uh, acetic acid or vinegar being one of them. So. Uh, like if you talk about grape vinegar, it would be vinegar that they obtain from the grape sugars. Uh, you know, they screw up the fermentation and rather than make an ethanol, they make acetic acid. Now one of the things that's also added to the uh, mixture when you start the fermentation is a little bit of uh, sulfites. Usually 
potassium metabisulfite, which is used to prevent the growth of wild yeast and to prevent oxygen oxidation. Sulfite is a very good oxygen scavenger, so we'll, we'll be talking about that uh, later when we get into uh, providing oxygen into uh, bioreactors. There's a technique for uh, measuring uh, that using sulfites. Also what happens is the sulfites are toxic, more toxic to wild strains of ye yeast, so it kills off the wild strains and keeps your uh, winemaking yeast uh, really happy. So there's just a little bit in there and if you look at a bottle of wine on the label it'll always say in the bottle that it contains some sulfites. It's just part of the uh, processing that's you know made used to make the wine. Some people are sensitive to sulfites. I run into folks that say that sulfites give them headaches and other GI problems and so on. Uh, you know those people are few and far between but it is something that happens. Okay, uh, the, making the wine, the first step then when you put everything together is called the primary fermentation. And that's best at around 70 degrees Fahrenheit and can take anywhere from 7 to 14 days. And a, a real easy way to follow the fermentation, how do you know when it's done? Uh, usually it's just by taking a sample of the must out of the fermenter. And uh, you'll see that the specific gravity, you, you drop, you know, you take a sample and then you drop one of these hydrometers, a glass tube kind of thing that's weighted and it's got a scale on it. I'll, I'll show you one uh, in one of the next slides. But uh, typically when you start out, your sugar and the juice would be such that your specific gravity is going to be about 1.09. And then as you use up all the sugar and convert that to ethanol, which actually has a density a little lower than water, the specific gravity will do drop down to 1.0 or 0.995. So that's your indication then that you've used up all of your uh, sugar and that the fermentation is uh, done. There's also the uh, balling or brick scale which are used uh, a lot of times candy makers I think uh, use that when they talk about uh, sugars but here's some relationships between the balling scale and the specific gravity. So a, a dry red or white wine will typically start with a specific gravity of about 1.09 to 1.095 and that'll be a, a starting sugar of around 22 to 23 weight percent uh, sugar. And if, if you buy a kit, most of the commercial kits you buy will have a juice concentrate in there and uh, you'll have like 20 liters of juice that you put in the fermenter and then you keep adding water up until you you get like um, a specific gravity in the 1.09 1.095 range so you kind of titrate the water in near the end keeping an eye on the specific gravity uh, what this means then is if this ferments out you'll, you'll get an alcohol level of about 13 volume percent uh, one, one thing I've always found when I made my own uh, wine and uh, we used to make the wine a batch or two of wine in the, in the uh, biochemical engineering class. I would just make it in my office up on the fifth floor of Nitschke Hall, which was kind of fun because the whole fifth floor would, would smell very fruity for about a week or two. And ev everybody on the fifth floor knew that uh, we were making wine up there just by the smell. But our, our wine always came out stronger. Uh, you know, California wines might be down around 11 to 12 percent wine for some reason. Uh, diluted a little bit. I think part of the reason is is uh, they don't want people to get buzzed too fast from their wine. You know, people kind of have an expectation that, you know, they want to drink a little more and then get the buzz rather than getting hit all at once, it seems. So uh, commercial wines tend to be a little bit lower in the alcohol level. Okay, so after the primary fermentation, you take everything out of the primary fermenter. You can use a siphon, or if it's a commercial operation, you'd pump it out, and you put it into what's called a secondary fermenter, and you put an airlock on it. Okay, it's just like a little bubble lock, so the CO2 has to bubble through a, a layer of water, and it keeps any oxygen from going back into the fermenter. And you typically let it sit for another... Uh, 30 days. One of the things that's going to happen 
is uh, by, by racking it into the secondary fermenter, it gets the wine off the, the lees. The, the, the lees are all the dead yeast from the primary fermentation that settle down to the bottom. If you just left the wine sit there for 30 more days in the primary fermenter, those uh, dead yeast cells start to break down and they puke out all their internal cellular material, which can add a funky taste uh, to the uh, to the wine. So the minute you know that the fermentation is completed in the primary fermenter, you want to get that wine off of the lees, get it into a secondary fermenter. That's where the re remaining sugars will also ferment out, and and there's also another settling step happening there. So after those 30 days, then you'd rack it uh, three or four more times, transfer it to another vessel, let it sit for three months. If you were running, running a commercial operation, that could take a whole year of racking and settling and racking and settling, letting the wine uh, age out. And once that process is done, then you would bottle and uh, store the wine. If you're doing it at home, you would add uh, clarifying agents so that you could speed up the settling process and, and get it done as quickly as uh, four to six weeks, and then you're ready to uh, bottle. And usually that, that wine is drinkable at that time, but I've often found that it does better if you let it uh, just sit around in the bottle for another three or four months and, and age a little bit. Uh, one, 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 one reason you can kind of speed up uh, winemaking at home too is that, is that the juice has already been sort of aging. Usually the juice that you buy may have been harvested up to a year ago, so it's had a time to, to kind of sit and that complex chemistry can kind of take place a little bit. So it's, it's already done some aging before you process it, whereas at a commercial uh, winery uh, in the fall, they crush the grapes, make the wine, and uh, you know the aging process is what they actually do with the bottled wine. Now if you want to have some fun and you want to taste a really really new wine uh, just about right now maybe more into October look for the Gamay Beaujolais. You, you can buy these at Kroger's they'll have very flowery labels and usually they have special uh, stands but there's a, a variety of uh, red wine called uh, Beaujolais, Gamay Beaujolais and uh, what this is a early uh, wine that's bottled. So basically, the French are probably in a hurry to uh, have some uh, fresh fall wine. Is they'll bottle the stuff right after they uh, uh, ferment it and clarify it and all that, and and they drink it right away. So it's nouveau. They'll have the word nouveau for new Gamay Beaujolais. So it's like brand new, right off the right off the press. So it's kind of a a fall treat to uh, drink some uh, Gamay Beaujolais. So, uh, you know, after you read this lecture, uh, run over to Kroger's and see if you can uh, find some and start drinking that. <clears throat> I'm not going to make any claims that it stops the COVID virus or anything like that, but. Uh. <laughs> okay, uh, making wine at home then. Uh, commercial wine is no more real wine than one made at home or at that time in our uh, in our class and the actual uh, the, the the grape source you can buy actual grapes I mean you can go to Kroger's or fruit markets uh, you can even go to some uh, 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 you know uh, what do you call them produce stores and some of them will actually order grapes for you from California okay so you can actually get the Cabernet Sauvignon grapes you might pay some pretty money uh, there's a place called Presque Isle, Presque Isle in Pennsylvania Winery. Uh, they sell a bunch of winemaking supplies. Uh, you can get fresh juice from them. So I've heard of people driving to Pennsylvania and getting 10 gallons of fresh pressed uh, wine uh, juice. Uh, and then there's also the, the concentrates. These come in the kits. And there's a variety of these kits that you can buy and they have everything you need to make the wine at home. All you have to do is just add about a gallon of water to get the specific gravity up to the uh, right uh, value. And the better of these kits require no additional sugar. So beware of any kit that says you have to add sugar to it because what that tells you is you got a very flabby, tasteless, uh, no grade uh, wine juice that it's probably pretty bad. So. Um, 
you don't want to do that. Uh, years and years ago, when I first wanted to make some wine in my class, I, I just bought uh, frozen cans of Welch's uh, grape juice and made a very good uh, uh, wine just from that. So that's even possible. Uh, another, uh, you can make blueberry wine. If you go and buy a whole bunch of blueberries and crush the blueberries, that, that makes a real good wine uh, as well. <clears throat> Here's what the grapes look like. The grapes tend to be smaller, or more look. Sometimes they look more like blueberries than those big, fat grapes that you know you typically get at the store and eat. Uh, this is in my uh, brother-in-law's garage up in Sarnia, Ontario, just over the uh, the, the bridge from Port Huron, Michigan. Uh, he's actually a chemical engineer. He used to be one of my uh, students years ago, and. Uh, I hooked him up with my wife's sister and they got married and uh, so he's been part of the family ever since but uh, he is a big winemaker up in Canada and you know in Canada they have huge huge taxes on alcohol so a lot of the people in Sarnia a lot of them being uh, Italians up there they like uh, to make uh, wine up there and these are actual grapes that he had uh, shipped in from uh, Napa Valley to make uh, wine. I was up there in September a few years ago and helped him uh, uh, crush and, and make all these wines. So that's what these pictures will show is uh, my brother-in-law actually uh, starting the process of making wine from these grapes. So he even bought a crusher. So what the crusher will do is take these grapes and these grapes are still on the stems so the, the crusher, very, very clever design, but it, it crushes the grapes and separates the stems and then the juice runs out down this trough down here. <clears throat> so you, you put the, the grapes up here in the top. There's these, uh, I don't know, like worm gears that, that crush the grapes you'll see in a minute. And then the uh, stems go in one direction and the juice goes in the other direction. So you can see here's the grapes in the crusher. You kind of want to make keep an eye on it because you know he's had dead animals and stuff. When you buy these grapes, you never know what's going to be in the grape case. But you can see all this the, the stems. So you don't want these stems going into the juice, and that's what this uh, crusher will will do for you. And then this is the top of the crusher you can see that the stems are coming out the top and then you just throw these out and the juice is all running down to the uh, other end. So at the end of the process uh, you can see what he has is a you know uh, a whole bunch of stems and then what he has is grapes and juice in the uh, primary fermenter. So here here comes the uh, crushed red grapes and the juice Okay, so he's collecting that into a big uh, container. And then what he has to do then is press. You have to then press these uh, grapes to get all of the juice uh, out of them. So he has a presser, and that's what this is here. And you just keep turning this screw down, and a plate comes down and uh, compresses the grapes, and the juice runs out uh, the bottom. And if he wants to make red wine, he keeps the, uh, uh, the the skins then go back in with the wine. And if you want to make white wine, uh, you don't put them together. But yeah, that's my brother-in-law, uh, Chuck. And you can see he's filling up these five-gallon glass carboys. And this is just sedimentation of all the other crap that was in the juice that's settling out. So he's going to let these settle out, and then he'll pull the juice out into the primary fermenter and then do the fermentation. So uh, that takes us then you've got the juice and then you go into the fermentation that I'll talk about. Uh, these pictures are uh, from my basement but here's the basic uh, winemaking tools that, that you would need in order to uh, do this at home and most of these things you can just go to Meyer or Walmart and, and buy stuff and put, put it all together. Uh, the primary fermenter, I use a, a 7 to 10 gallon uh, waste basket of food grade poly. It's made out of, you don't want to buy any trash cans that got built in odor control things. You know, some of them have the, you know, like Febreze and crap in them like that. And, oh my God, I hate the smell of Febreze. But imagine if that was in your wine, it'd be, it'd be awful. 
Uh, you want at least two five gallon glass carboys and I'll show you at the end of the references there's uh, wine suppliers that you can buy this stuff from uh, to get started. A simple siphon just to move fluid from one container to another. Some stirring spoons, maybe a, a bottle brush to clean uh, bottles. You can recycle wine bottles, save some money that way. Uh, fermentation locks are just these little uh, cork things that go on top of the carboy bottles that have a water airlock to keep oxygen out. Some type of a measuring cup. Uh, you'll want to get a hydrometer to keep track of the specific gravity and, and when you make up your initial uh, solution. You'll need a thermometer to check the temperature. If, if, if it's too cold, the fermentation might not start and that's called a stuck fermentation. So sometimes you have to heat, you know, like if you've got a cold basement or something like that, it might be too cool to get the fermentation going. Uh, in my basement in the winter, I've had to put in a small immersion aquarium heater just to get the temperature up around 72, 73 degrees. You get the fermentation going, and then once it's going, you can turn that off because there's enough heat just generated by the fermentation. Uh, an acid test kit that you can buy from the... Uh, wine suppliers, a record book to keep notes of everything you're doing. You want to write everything down because it is kind of a slow process and you might forget what you did. Uh, bottles and corks to bottle it and then nice things to have is a wine thief. This is called a wine thief. It's just a way to quickly grab a sample. You stick this into the sample, put your finger over the top hole and then you know you can pull that right out and you've got a sample. Uh, a bottle corker is a, is a device that allows you to press the uh, cork into the bottle. So you might, you might spend $50 to $200. You might be able to find you stuff online on eBay or Craigslist. Uh, but if you're, I've, I've had students put all this together. And most students, uh, you know, they're making it in their closet in the kitchen. I've also had students get into to beer making. I've never made my own beer, but uh, I've had many students, uh, after uh, hearing all this about winemaking, they're, they're more of uh, beer drinkers, so uh, they go that route. Beer, beer making is actually a little faster, too, so it, it happens a little quicker. Making the wine, uh, here's my primary fermenter, and then I just put a, a plastic... Uh, uh, cover on top to keep you know critters and everything out put a spoon or something across the top the co2 generates and creates its own airlock and, and escapes out through the little spaces between your plastic cover and so on uh, you want to have a sanitizer so I use uh, you can use three tablespoons of potassium metal bisulfite to two liters of water you swish that around, scrub the sides, and so on. I never use soaps or anything like that when I uh, when I make up my uh, sanitizers. I just use the metabisulfite that kills everything off. Um, this stuff really, really stinks. It's it kind of an asthmatic uh, irritant. So if you've got breathing problems, do not breathe this because it can trigger something. Um, also, you don't have to worry about pathogenic bacteria and stuff. I've had people worrying about, you know, am I going to get the flu? Am I going to get, you know, bacterial meningitis when I drink this wine? The good news is, is these fermentations occur <coughs> at rather low uh, pHs, and things that are pathogenic to our bodies, harmful to our bodies, will not grow in uh, this fermenter. So you don't have to worry about anything like that. The only bad thing that can really happen to you is that if you get oxygen in there, if you didn't cover this thing, you would just start to form these organic acids, which would uh, give the wine a, a bad taste. So that's the only thing that can happen. After you sanitize it, then rinse it really well until you don't smell anything anymore. Okay. <clears throat> Here's uh, some kits. This is what a kit looks like. Heron Bay makes nice kits. You can probably go online and order a kit. Uh, you can go to Presque Isle or you could probably go to Amazon, order a kit. They're about 75 bucks. They'll make about uh, 25 bottles of wine. So if you think about it, you know, a decent bottle of wine is about 15 to $20. So 
uh, you know, the value of your wine could be as high as $500 when you're done with this, and you could, and it costs you $75. So uh, these kits usually have juices that are uh, high high quality. Okay, they're they're almost only semi uh, concentrated. You just add about seven liters of water to get the specific gravity. They even come with a little bag of oak chips so that you can get some aging effect on wood they've got the yeast in it they've got everything you need all you have to do is just be able to read and follow the directions and you will you will be successful making wine so then you pour that juice into the primary fermenter take an initial specific gravity reading this is what the juice looks like uh, this particular case the juice had a specific gravity of 1.34 which tells you that it's really highly concentrated with sugar and then you add the additional seven liters of water to give you 23 liters and the specific gravity should be in that 1.09 1.095 range sprinkle your oak chips on the surface uh, here's the this is what the hydrometer looks like you've probably uh, seen these uh, but in this particular case sticking way up in the air like this this is one right here specific gravity of one which would be like water so you can see we're way down here at 1.09 so we got a lot of sugar in there and we have the right uh, specific gravity to get this started once the juice is in the fermenter and the specific gravity is correct you make your yeast starter always use a cultured commercial winemaking yeast I wouldn't recommend using one that's used for uh, baking or anything like that uh, there's a Red Star brand Pasture Red, which is a good, strong, even fermenter. Produces a full-bodied wine with uh, complex flavors. Uh, good for the Cabernet family of grapes. So what you want to do is mix the yeast with some of your juice and let it sit for about 30 to 60 minutes so that the yeast gets uh, activated. Then you want to check the acid content. Normally now I've been finding that the kits come with the acid already adjusted uh, but it's still kind of fun to test it if you want to buy a little test kit it's pretty easy um, if you don't get the acidity right you're going to have a, a flat or flabby tasting wine it just doesn't have any punch or body to it um, you know the acids interact with the alcohol gives it more fruitiness and bouquet and uh, you can buy what's called an acid blend that you add in there which has the tartaric malic and citric acids and you just adjust it using colorimetric methods if you, if you got your own pH meter you can use a, a pH meter to measure the uh, acidity as well and, and they tell you how to convert the uh, measured pH into how much acid blend needs to be added then we add a little bit of tannin gives wine some astringency which is that pucker if, if you buy sometimes you go to a store and you'll see like a thirty dollar bottle of wine selling for ten ten bucks nine times out of ten that wine has way too much uh, tannic acid way too much tannin I mean if you take a sip of it you just like pucker up it's like yuck okay there's just something's just not right so you just want to put a little bit in there, like an eighth of a teaspoon per gallon. It'll also help the wine to clear and helps prolong the life. Then you'll also want to put a little yeast nutrient in there. Uh, this provides the elements. This is like fertilizer for yeast. It provides elements and vitamins essential for a good fermentation. It's got a nitrogen source in there. You just put a little bit of that in there. It's, it's basically just old yeast I think that they grind up and, and recycle and uh, use as a nutrient. Place a, a loose plastic cover over. You can see I've got the mark on my uh, primary fermenter for the volume. Put that cover on, put something on top of it to, to keep it from uh, uh, falling off or anything like that. And then after a day or so, you should see some vigorous bubbling happening. Uh, this thing will start to foam and actually rise, in some cases, almost to the top. That's called a cap. Don't disturb the cap or anything. It, it serves as, a, as an airlock, keeps the oxygen out. And then every few days, uh, pull out a sample, check the specific gravity, 
and, and keep it in the primary fermenter, as I mentioned, until that specific gravity drops down to one or less. And this is just my uh, floating thermometer floating around inside the, uh, the wine. So here's the time schedule. You know, if you want to do this uh, really slow, uh, primary fermentation may be up to two weeks. Secondary would be 30 days. If you do a slow racking process, this would be the process. So it could take, you know, nine months or so until you're done, six to nine months bottle, and then enjoy your wine. If you're using a, a wine kit, uh, they have clarifiers in there that between the clarification of the secondary fermentation and the addition of the clarifiers and letting it sit for a few weeks, uh, you can start the bottle after a, a, a couple of weeks and it really speeds up the whole uh, process and you'll, you'll still have a very, uh, very nice wine. Here's the progress of the fermentation. You're probably wondering, well, where's the engineering in all this? Well, here's, here's a fermentation from a few years back. And what we've got plotted here on this graph is we've got the uh, yeast concentration in grams per liter on the ordinance. So one of the things you're going to see when we start talking about um, uh, fermentations and the production of products from uh, cells is the cell density, which goes with, by the symbol capital X. You might have uh, used capital X when you were in the bioprocessing lab and did some of this. And, uh, and the typical uh, cell density we use is grams per uh, liter. And this would be the dry weight. So you pull the sample out, you dry it in an oven, and then it's the dry weight. It's not the wet weight. <clears throat> but by looking at, at this, we can see the progress of the fermentation. So this initial little red guy right here that's just what happened right after we added the yeast from the packet so you can see we were at a concentration of about 0.25 grams per liter and then we let it sit for a week and you can see that it was about 0.75 and then at nine days one and a half and then two and then at 12 days or yeah about 12 well, maybe 13 days it got a little over three grams per liter and then it started to drop down. Okay, so the fermentation ended right in here. The reason it's dropping down is because the yeast have run out of sugar. They're dying and settling down and forming uh, those leaves. So this would, you know, definitely would be the time to end the fermentation. And you can see that as well with the uh, specific gravity chart over here. Here's specific gravity versus days. There's our initial uh, specific gravity up around 1.09. Uh, you can see after about a week the fermentation's kicking in and then rapidly, rapid decrease as the sugar uh, gets consumed and the alcohol gets produced forming a, a solution with a specific gravity a little less than uh, that of water. Here's the end of the primary fermentation. Now the hydrometer sinks all the way down to the bottom. Uh, this is what's happening. This is that cap that gets formed, very active fermentation. But once it all ends, this will just kind of collapse on itself. And then you're just back down to whatever your initial volume of fluid was. Then you add a half a teaspoon of potassium metabisulfite into your uh, carboys, these glass five-gallon, six-gallon jugs. There's the airlock on top. Uh, just set the primary fermenter up on a, on a height, higher surface, and just siphon it into the jug. Uh, here's my uh, golden retriever boomer at the time, inspecting the whole operation, making sure everything is okay. You can see, I think he enjoys the, uh, the smell. Okay, so you would rack every couple months. Each time, add a little uh, potassium metabisulfite into the jug. That'll prevent any oxidation and prevent any wild strains of yeast or other things from uh, spoiling uh, your product. And then you bottle and enjoy and these wine producing suppliers they can provide you with nice looking wine bottles, labels that you can add whatever you want to, uh, to do. You can see uh, this one here I, I called it Blues at Sunrise. This was a Cabernet uh, Sauvignon 
I think Blues at Sunrise, uh, one of the Kings, it wasn't Freddie King, was it B.B. King, Albert King, I think Albert King, if you're into the blues, uh, go on YouTube and listen to the song Blues at Sunrise. Okay, so I think uh, that does this lecture. Here's some uh, references if you want to get into winemaking. Here's some books uh, that you can read. Uh, best source for winemaking supplies, Presque Hill Wine Cellars in Pennsylvania. Very good service. Uh, they can provide you with everything you need. If you want to go into a store and actually buy all this stuff, uh, there's a hardware store over on Western Avenue in South Toledo. Uh, called Titka Myers. Uh, take the Anthony Wayne Trail from downtown, make a left on Western, and it's a few blocks down on the right hand side. He's, he's, he's got a huge uh, wine making and beer making operation uh, going on there. Okay, so that's it for this lecture, and next week we'll get back into the book and, and dig into the details then of uh, what's going on with these fermentations and how you design in size uh, fermenters.